this to be one of the stories of the calling of the apostles, and so we could leave it at that as he calls them together. However, I'm here to tell you it is entirely more than that. This is a depiction of how each of us becomes part of Christ's way. And in this storyline, in these pictures, we find the clues to divine wisdom that empowers us right now to become disciples, followers, to live the way of Christ. So this is not once upon a time. This is for right now. Let me set the stage in the few verses ahead of time. You had John the Baptist, first great prophet in 400 years to be back in the land of prophets. And in those days, people, the chosen people, were especially hungry and excited about spiritual things. That's what made them the chosen people. They loved their rabbis. You see there in one of the translations, rabbi meaning teacher, but in Hebrew, rabbi means my great one. They loved the rabbis. They were fed spiritually by these sages and holy men. And yet we find the first off as soon as Jesus appears and John says, there goes the Lamb of God. Two of his disciples immediately follow, knowing that a whole new thing is happening. Not another holy man, not another wise man, not another teaching, something quantum from God. Otherwise, they would have stayed with their school, their rabbi. So they follow Jesus. And what we find is in this gospel known as the spiritual gospel, the very first words of Jesus. You have to agree with me that the very first words of Jesus in the spiritual gospel have got to be powerful, meaningful. Know that they are absolutely not for a few disciples in the first century. They are for the inside of your spirit right now. Are you ready to hear the living words of Christ? What do you seek? What do you seek? What deep in here, the yearning in here that you might not even be able to put words to? He goes straight to the heart of our being, past all ambition and desire for success and acceptance and all of that to the very root of why we exist, to the meaning of our lives. What do you see? What a magnificent question to begin the spiritual journey because it brings together all those other questions. Who am I? Why am I here? Surely some of us in this vast crowd of seekers have asked themselves such questions. You know, it is those who take it all for granted and never wonder what they're doing on this planet who leave it not knowing. We have to begin with, what are we seeking? My friends and friends call that feeling inside a nostalgia a nostalgia for the spiritual. And I hope for all of you to have some sensitivity for that. And these two disciples respond, Rabbi, where are you staying? This is why I always remind you to read it literally. They don't want to know the motel address in Nazareth where he's staying. Where are you staying? What is that word staying? We hear it someplace else, translated differently. Where do you abide? Where is the center of your being rooted? Who are you in the sight of God? How do you commune with God? You see, they know that He is in touch with that which is available to all of us. We are all meant to be God-centered. And it's when we go off track, which is all the time, that chaos and misery follow. History of humanity. Where do you abide? What does he say? Come and see. Now you know again that these active verbs are for you. 
in this 21st century, they are timeless. Make the effort to find out. In Greek, that word see doesn't mean see with your eyes. It means experience. Come and experience. I will show you how to experience the reality of Holy Spirit in this moment, in this fragile journey through time. And so they follow me. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. Two words. Well, let's make it three with the story. He found Philip. Now that is incredibly amazing. It's not that Philip was seeking him, looking for a rabbi, looking for a teacher. He found Philip. So there are times when we're not looking for God. We're not even interested in the subject. And yet God finds us. That happens to a lot of us going in totally opposite direction, and God breaks through in you. So even as we are called to seek and you will find, sometimes you just get found, whether you want to or not. And I love the great Isaiah saying, listen now, I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. I was found by those who did not seek me. About. So we don't have to be a special esotericist or reader of spiritual things. Just be that human being. I told a friend the other day, open the door and let yourself be found. Open yourself to that possibility. See what happens. So he finds Philip. And Philip immediately recognizes that this is the one. Going all the way back to Moses when it was spoken to him at the height of his life in God that a prophet like him would appear again. He didn't know how long from now, but the promise was there. Philip recognizes the promise, and so he runs to Nathaniel, and that's a teaching. The only way a place like this, the body of Christ on earth, surviving the storm, the way it grows is not with bells and whistles and uh, fancy tricks. It's word of mouth, one person at a time. Come and see. Come and discover what is feeding you. Come and find people who are searching. That's how it grows. That's how it grew from the beginning, from 12 people who then around the Mediterranean basin filled the world with these teachings change the world. So he goes to Nathaniel, telling him with, can you imagine the excitement? This is it. This is the Messiah, the anointed one, the long-awaited one. And what do we get? Nathaniel being a good old rational human being, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Nathaniel lives six miles away in Cana. He knows Nazareth. There's nothing special there. Why should anything special come out of Nazareth? You know that? reflects, we can't see past the ordinary. We take everything for granted. We don't see spirit in each other. We miss the magnificence of God's world alive and well in front of us. Can anything good come out of Master? What an offensive thing to say, don't you think? If that was said about you, you know, you take a little offense. But what happens here? The master says, there is an Israelite in whom there is no guile, no deceit. In other words, he pays them a glorious compliment. More than that, he sees right through him, right, right through his doubts, right through his rudeness, right through his limitations, to the beauty of his soul. Despite the offense, he completely puts that aside, which is something that's hard for us to do. Jesus is beyond all that. And Nathaniel can't believe it. It's like a clairvoyant sight of who he really is, of his true identity. And so he cries out. He cries out, how do you know me? How can you know me? We're strangers. How do you know the depths of my soul? You know, Jesus knows the depths of our soul. And we get this strange line, I saw you under the fig tree. I gotta tell you something about fig. 
because nothing can be taken for granted in Holy Scripture. The fig tree was the sweetest fruit in the desert. In fact, the prophets, when they predicted peace in the land, Micah, listen, every man will sit under his own vine and under his own fig tree, and no one will make them afraid. And fig trees were famous for being the place, the shadow they spread across the ground where the rabbis talked. So Nathaniel, under the fig tree, is in contemplation or reading scripture or seeking something, something spiritual, and Jesus sees it and blows his mind, reveals immediately that yes, something special can come out of nowhere, out of Nazareth even. Jesus answers, you believe because I told you I saw you in the fig, you know, like a clairvoyant trip. You will see greater things than these. And then he uses the example, truly you will see heaven open up, angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. That is the image from the ancient story of Jacob. Remember Jacob? I'm sure you all know Jacob. Jacob, whose name was turned to Israel in his spiritual experience, and he saw that ladder of angels ascending and descending. What did he say in that moment of spiritual vision? Surely this is the place of God. Surely I am on holy ground. He awakens to the reality of the holy. And so this whole thing is about each of us entering into that consciousness of Christ and seeing each other, the world entirely different. And I want to say one more thing. Follow me. We all know that term. Some of us don't like it by definition because it sounds like we have to be passive sheep following teacher. Some folks see that as cult leader, uh, not thinking for yourself. Let me give you a twist on that one. Greek word, apokolutheo, doesn't mean follow me, it means walk alongside me. Walk with me, walk in my way. And I'll take it a step further, where this before perhaps, for those of you who know French, the verb sui is to follow. But then you've got your conjugation that they found in your head, right? Je suis, tu es, il est, nous sommes, vous êtes, ils sont. Je suis, I am. In other words, sui moi is be me. He doesn't want followers back there. He wants other Christs with him on the way to God. God-centered people who recognize what is possible in this world. That is Christ's mission. That is his calling to each of us so that each of us can fulfill our potential to live in the presence of God all the days of our lives.